Hello, and welcome to this Royal Society video podcast. As you can see, we're here in the prehistoric gallery at the University of Manchester with Dr. Phil Manning and Dr. Roy Rogelius. Together, they have co-authored a paper published in Proceedings B entitled Infrared Mapping Resolves Soft Tissue Preservation in 50 Million Year Old Reptile Skin. This research uses novel techniques in order to isolate and study organic matter in prehistoric fossils, revealing never before known secrets into the history of life on Earth. So, Phil, why should we be interested in the processes of fossilisation in the first place? Fossils are found all over the planet. And if you just look at how much life is alive on the planet today, you'd think it's quite a simple process. Animal dies, becomes fossil, paleontologist finds it. But we would be up to our armpits in fossils if the process of fossilisation was simple. It really isn't. To become a fossil is actually very, very hard and it almost has to be a perfect storm in terms of the chemistry, the environment, and the moment of death. All these things come together to allow for exceptional preservation, in some cases, but usually a few disjointed sentences left for us to dig up. This work uses modern chemical techniques, including infrared and X-ray mapping. Why did you decide to apply these particular techniques to the fossil specimens? The reason we chose infrared imaging first was to spatially map organic molecules which might have been originally manufactured by the organism itself, the lizard. And you can map them in literally within the scales. And the really beautiful part of this research was we could take another set of data from the X-ray mapping and have a different way of testing whether or not these molecules were endogenous, literally formed by the organism, and we could transpose the data set from the X-ray with the infrared, and they kind of mapped together. It was beautiful. It was... That's why we used the two techniques. They supported each other. It was a way of ground-truthing our own research. The other side to this is the fact that in spectroscopy, let's say the area of expertise that I come from, things have been focused on miniaturization, getting down to the molecular level, molecular level. The thing about the fossils is that you really, you know, like taking, taking a chest x-ray of a patient wouldn't be very useful if you just got a square centimeter. And with analyzing the fossils, one of the things that was quite challenging and interesting to us was that we needed to do the whole organism. We needed to look at the whole thing before we could try and make sense out of the very complicated um, overprint of fos fossilization and then try and tease out the original chemical details. And so that's why a multi-technique approach using modern mapping techniques um, seem to us to be the way forward. So what did these techniques reveal? Some, some tremendous chemical detail that 10 years ago I, I myself would have been quite skeptical about. But what we find is that some of the um, molecular fragments, some of the organic functional groups are still present and they map, we can map them, so we can map some of the preserved organic chemicals still within the skin of this 50 million year old reptile. Now we, we had good reason to think that they would be there because we'd done some work previously on a, uh, an exceptionally preserved fossil called the dino mummy. It's a dinosaur, um, Edmontosaurus. And we were able to extract some chemical information, but because the sediments were uh, friable, they, were, they kind of broke apart when we tried to analyze them, we couldn't image anything. And this bedding plane fossil gave us a chance to image and the, the chemical detail is absolutely fantastic. And what we found also when we did the x-ray mapping is that we have elemental information along with molecular information. So we have trace metals that map together with the organic compounds that were originally were in the skin. Your research claims to find 50 million year old keratin on this reptile skin. How do we know for sure that this is from the reptile skin and not from, say, plant matter? That's a really good question. And that's, what we, that's where most of the work, most of the hard work of the paper comes from, is we find these maps and then how do you know what you know, How do you know that what you found is original? And so we did test after test after test. To say that the keratin that has been found within the fossil belongs to that organism when it was alive and it's been preserved within that fossil and has not come from an outside source is because it's discreetly mapped within the scales of this fossil. To, to place the keratin breakdown products discreetly into each individual scale involves an almost impossible process that 
It's much harder to do that. It's easier to say, well, they've actually stayed in place and just broken down and we've got the remnant products which we can image using the infrared spectroscopy. Part of our testing also went into the possibility of microbial contamination. And that's always going to be a big problem when you're looking at fossils. I mean, any kind of specimen, actually, you have to worry about microbes. So part of what the pyrolysis GCMS told us is that we didn't have whole panes, and so we don't have modern microbial contamination at all. And then the fact that we tested for plant remains, we, we compared our results with plant remains, and the, uh, the organic chemical inventory is completely different. Um, we can't rule out a little bit of microbial activity, but the microbes would have to have been so intelligent to only process the skin and only leave behind the, the um, beta keratin residue that we expect from skin, along with the trace metals that we expect in skin, um, that would be pretty clever microbes. How are these results altering our understanding of the history of life on Earth? <laughs> Not a small question, the history of life on Earth. Um, to every single piece of information that paleontology and the allied disciplines can bring to ancient life helps piece together a little bit more in our terms of our understanding of that ancient life. It is impossible to say, oh yes, we understand the whole ancient community, because we don't get whole communities fossilized. We get little fragments. So when you can see something as critical as the actual composition of the original organism. It tells you about that animal. It tells you how it relates to the modern forms, but also how it actually came to be preserved in the very first place, which is of critical importance. Do they have a wider significance outside paleontology? Paleontology gives us the 2020 hindsight we so want when we want to understand what happens when you bury something in the ground. The fossil record is the longest experiment ever to be run in terms of understanding what happens to life when you bury it. We have time step samples from the most recent sediments to deep geological time, to the beginnings of life on Earth, complex life maybe 600 million years ago to the present day. There's a wonderful record for us to plummet the depths to find out what these things mean in terms of their composition, evolutionary relationships and so on. This work has massive implications for understanding how we can not only see how their animals are preserved, but also what happens when you bury something today in the ground. How long is that going to impact on a specific environment? Is it going to pollute that specific environment? Is it safe? Because if you bury anything in the ground in enough quantities, it's considered a pollutant. And if that pollutant is not stable, you can cause all manner of problems. The fossil record provides us with the longest experiment to help test and see whether or not what we're doing today is going to impact life in the future. This work is a collaboration between lots of different disciplines, including geochemistry and paleontology. How did this enhance the study, and did you have any difficulties? For me, it's been a complete minefield trying to navigate through the many disciplines which I'm having to interface with as a paleontologist. I deal with particle physicists, organic geochemists, inorganic geochemists, sedimentologists, geologists, biologists, trace metal experts. It's, it's terrifying, but at the same time, it's totally enlightening. And I, I think the reason why more people don't do it, it is really hard, but the benefits outweigh any of the hassles. And it only works if you find people who are willing to, for five minutes, let's say, not be an expert. And that's one of the reasons why the collaboration with Phil has worked out quite so well, because I don't understand all the details of the paleontology. I can contribute to the geochemistry. And working together, and then also with Uva, working on the physics side of things, working together, just being willing to step back and learn from each other, I think, I think that's the key to multidisciplinary research. And um, I've learned a tremendous amount about paleontology. The whole idea about trace metal uh, uptake into skin and trace metalculation is, is, is actually very, very interesting. And there's a rich area for cross-collaboration work in the future. No longer do we look at fossils as these inert objects devoid of life. They now have huge potential to unlock our understanding of biological pathways, interactions of these organisms within their original environments, how they were preserved. So many questions 
which were hard to answer with the original tool set that we were given for paleontology. This multidisciplinary tool set is terrifying, but it's also completely changing the whole field. So this works still quite in the early stages. What can we expect in the future? This is new ground and it opens up soft tissue analysis. So it means that we can look at plant remains, invertebrates, and then also look at the soft tissue in vertebrate residue. And so really, the way I would put it is we've just opened a door. What is interesting for me as a paleontologist, working with the many disciplines which are now interacting with our field, is that every day I hear of a new technique that can shine some new light on the understanding of a very old problem. Archaeopteryx we'd known about for 150 years, but only a few months ago we were looking at the Archaeopteryx with new technology at a synchrotron that completely changed our perception of that fossil. It's when something is a museum specimen, it's thought, well, it's been through the research process. Not anymore. This is really exciting stuff. Thank you so much for talking with us today. And thank you for watching this Royal Society video podcast.